Good morning. From darkness and despair, from being lost and lonely, God calls us home. Even though we have been selfish and let God down, we are still called God's beloved. This morning, remember the eternal love of God, which has been poured out for us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let our hearts rejoice at the wondrous ways in which God loves us and forgives us. Let us remember that in all our ways, we can trust in God's compassion. Let us worship God. It is good to be with you as we worship on this, the Lord's Day at the Wallace Presbyterian Church. I'm glad all of you are here, especially our visitors who are here with us today. Please take time to sign the friendship pad and use that to greet each other in the name of Christ. It's an exciting day in the life of this church as we come to celebrate the sacrament of baptism with Olive Elizabeth Merritt and her family, and also as we recognize Cheryl Brinkley. Um, please notice the announcements in the bulletin. Next Sunday, we will celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper during worship. The Lenten service this week is Thursday at 12.05 in the Worsley Chapel at Wallace United Methodist Church, and the speaker is our own Dr. Dan Robinson. So I hope that you'll be able to come and worship with the community. Please notice other announcements in the bulletin about things that are happening. I'd like to ask Cheryl Brinkley to come up here with me, please, which is about the last thing in the world she wants to do, I'm sure. <laughs> All the way up here. Mm -hmm. You do. Now you have to preach. It'll be a short one. It'll be a short one. You'll be very popular. So, this is the first voice you hear when you call 285 2808. She's always willing to help church members with whatever they need. She's creative and innovative whenever someone asks, do you think maybe we could do this? And she finds a way to do it. She's the editor of our monthly newsletter. She's the taskmaster over me. She's the keeper of our church records. She's the food pantry assistant. She's the webmaster for our church website. And I want to let you know we receive numerous compliments on our church website from other people not in this church for its layout, its design, and most of all, because it's up to date. And so many people say, oh, I go to church websites and they're so out of date. It's because of Cheryl. I call her Ms. Secretary because when Judy Rush was our parish nurse, she called me Mr. Pastor and Cheryl Ms. Secretary. And so she I call her Miss Secretary. She used to call me Mr. Pastor until one day we got a letter here at the church addressed to Wallace Phillips. <laughs> and so now I'm WP, and that's what she calls me, <laughs> WP. Dear Reverend Wallace Phillips. But most of all, Cheryl is a trusted and valued colleague and a good friend, and she's a true minister to God's people as a church secretary. She's been here 25 years which is a really long time, but not long enough. No. Yeah. So, um, would you please introduce who's here from your family okay. today? Uh, that's my oldest son, Chris. Most of you know him because he played the organ here one summer in Music Carolina. And that's my youngest, Kevin. And that's his wife, Kat. And that's my two nieces, twin nieces, Katie and Kelsey Parkhurst. Glad y'all are here. And Kevin was six when I started working here, so. <laughs> and when I look at him, I realize. Careful what you say. Yeah. <laughs> that I've been here 25 years. <laughs> and then when I look at your hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we did have some gifts we were going to give you, but. <laughs> he knows. He knows I love him. She's older than I am. <laughs> the flowers are in your honor, and you can take those home. Okay. It wasn't in the bulletin because it's supposed to be a it's surprise. surprise. <laughs> uh, and knowing you, it probably wasn't, but act no. surprised. Uh, I, I did 
didn't, you didn't know. know. No, no. And this is a card and a gift for you from the congregation okay. and all of us. And Vanessa oh, okay. has something for you. She's got a prayer shawl. Thank you all. It's, it doesn't seem like 25 years, but I've enjoyed every day of it, and I hope I've worked some more. <laughs> At least tomorrow. <laughs> See you in the morning. Look in your bulletins and read with me the opening sentences. Come, let us celebrate the forgiving, reconciling love of God. For once we were lost and felt so far away, now we have been found and welcomed home. Know that God's love is lavished upon us forever. We rejoice in the news and forgive us in hope. Come, let us celebrate and praise the God of love. Amen. Our opening hymn is hymn 482, Baptized in Water.
We entreat you, be reconciled to God. For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. For God says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you, and on the day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. With faith and hope, let us confess our sin with the prayer, unison prayer, our silent prayers, and our assurance of pardon. Please join me. How easily we leave your side, Lord God, for a place far away. We are blind in our darkness, so open our eyes to our sins. Unless you strengthen our spirits and create our hearts anew, we cannot make the journey home. Guide us to your welcoming arms to the music and the dancing, for we are easily lost, and only you, our Father, can find us. Lord, hear our prayers. How are you right with God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ, even though my conscience accused me of having grievously sinned, nevertheless, without my deserving it at all, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ, as if I had never sinned nor been a sinner as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. All I need do is accept this gift of God with a believing heart. Let us sing God's praises for his mercy in our lives. seated. On fifth Sundays, we take up an offering, the fifth Sunday building offering, it's used to help keep this physical plant in shape and in good repair so that we might have worship and engage in our different ministries. Thank you for your contributions.
Surely it is a joy when we baptize anyone into the family of faith. At this time, I'd like to invite Jeffrey and Elizabeth Merritt to bring their daughter Olive and her big brother Jonah up for the sacrament of baptism and Elder Dave Wells, otherwise known as Pappy, to come and stand with us. Through the sacrament of baptism, the church declares its faith in the crucified and risen Christ and reasserts his claim to every human life. Through this act, we receive this child into the fellowship of the church and we care for Olive as a member of God's family. By bringing their child for baptism, Jeffrey and Elizabeth give expression to their own faith and promise that what is done here shall be no empty ritual but the sign and seal of God's love for them and their own love and worship of God. We baptize Olive today with the hope and prayer that one day she will make her own profession of faith in Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. In the baptism of this child, we are reminded that we have all been claimed for Christ and we commit ourselves again to live in his love, which we know through his death on the cross for our sins. Therefore, by sharing in this sacrament, we all take on ourselves the responsibility to play our part in the proclamation of Christ's love to the ends of the earth and in the Christian nurture of Olive Elizabeth Merritt. On the behalf of the session, I present Olive Elizabeth Merritt, daughter of Elizabeth Wells Merritt, Jeffrey Merritt, and brother of Jonah Merritt to you for the Holy Sacrament of Baptism. Jeffrey and Elizabeth, I have these questions for you. Do you desire to have Olive baptized? Do you? Do you reaffirm your own faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Do you? Do you claim God's covenant promises on Olive's behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation as you do for your own? Do you? Do you now unreservedly promise in humble reliance upon God's grace to set before Olive an example of the new life in Christ, do you? And finally, do you promise to pray with and for Olive and to bring her up in the knowledge and love of God, do you? Do we, the members of the congregation, <laughs> in the name of the whole church of Jesus Christ, undertake with Jeffrey and Elizabeth the Christian nurture of Olive so that in due time she may confess faith in Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, do we? Amen. Will we endeavor by example and fellowship to strengthen Olive's family ties with the household of God, do we? It's always a good time and thing to affirm our faith, but especially at times like this, I invite you to stand if you're able and to join in affirming our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed that are printed in the bulletin today. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Eternal and gracious God, we give you thanks. In countless ways, you have revealed yourself in ages past and have blessed us with signs of your grace. We praise you that through the waters of the sea, you led your people Israel out of bondage into freedom in the land of your promise. We praise you for sending Jesus, your son, who was baptized for us in the waters of the Jordan 
anointed as the Christ by your Holy Spirit. Through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you have set us free from the bondage of sin and death and have given us cleansing and rebirth. We praise you for your Holy Spirit who teaches us and leads us into all truth, filling us with a variety of gifts that we might proclaim the gospel to all nations. We rejoice that you have claimed us in our baptism and that by your grace we are born anew. By your Holy Spirit, renew us, O Lord, that we may be empowered to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ. We bless you for the water with which you bless us. We pray that Olive Elizabeth, who comes to the waters of life, will live in your grace and share in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Send your Holy Spirit upon all of us and upon this water that all who are gathered under this sign may be one in Christ. Glory be to you forever and ever. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we remember our baptisms and are thankful. Olive Elizabeth Merritt, for you. <laughs> Christ entered the world. He lived and he died for you, and you don't know about it yet. But we love because God first loved us. Olive Elizabeth Merritt, child of the covenant. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Olive Elizabeth Merritt, you've been claimed by God through baptism and marked as Christ's own by the sign of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. I'm going for a walk. It's Olive Elizabeth Merritt. She lives up in the Raleigh area with her mom and dad and big brother. And they have been attending the First Presbyterian Church of Raleigh. But you're going to see a lot of Olive because her grandparents live right across the street. <laughs> so I bet she's going to be here a lot. But I charge you to be faithful to your promises to help Jeffrey and Elizabeth Help Olive grow in her love and knowledge of the Lord, not just by what you say, but especially by what you do. There's Mama. I'll give her back. This is Olive's baptismal certificate. I hope you'll show that to her at some time and talk to her and a gift from the Presbyterian women that explains. And Vanessa has a gift for you. I'd like to invite the children to come up here where I am by the baptismal font for the children's sermon. You can't see? Y'all come over here. Come over here so you can see. That, there you go. See if you can be sure you can get somewhere where you can see. Here comes Lane Phillips. Hey, Jack, you're exploring, just like his bib said, you want me to hold you? Can you see Lane Phillip? Why don't you come back over here by Miller and stand on the steps? We've come up here before. Yeah, y'all have found the water. 
And we have a little cup here that's been used in the Wells family when they baptized babies. So I put some water in there. I was thinking about water. We've had a lot of it around here with a lot of rain. But have you noticed how green it is outside? It's really pretty now. And the, the rain helps things turn. It is cold. But, you know, it wasn't cold when I put it in there. But it, it got cool real fast. But the water helps things turn green and helps the flowers grow and the azaleas and the dogwoods and the seeds that maybe some of y'all have planted. And I know you know that we use water to clean ourselves, like to take a bath or a shower. But we also, but we also drink it to stay alive and we swim in it to have fun. And we wash our cars with it, and our dogs and cats. Well, I don't guess we wash our cats. I wouldn't want to do that. But yes, they do. But the reason we baptize people with water, one, is because Jesus got baptized with water, but also because it reminds us that God gives us life, and God cleanses us from our sins, just like when you're dirty and you take a bath and get all nice and clean. There's nothing magic about this water. I got it out of the kitchen sink, right back there in the kitchen. But we use it for a very special purpose. And today we used it to welcome baby Olive into the family of God. That doesn't mean God hadn't been loving her until today. And we use it for puppies to drink. We use it for puppies to drink, that's right. That's right. And, and for a puppy to eat. You think they eat the water? And they eat food. And they eat food. That's right. That's right. So, well, let's have a prayer. And in the prayer, I'm going to thank God for the water that he gives us. Okay, let's pray. And take your hands out of the water and fold them and pray. That'd be good. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for water. It feels so good to drink it when we're thirsty. It feels good when we're dirty to take a bath. It feels good to swim in it in a swimming pool or in the ocean. But Lord, we thank you that it keeps us alive and that this water reminds us of how much you love us. You love us so much that you sent your son to be our savior. We pray and give you thanks. Amen. I'll put you down. You ready?
Please join me in our prayer for illumination that's in the bulletin as we get ready to hear from the Word of God. Let us pray together. Loving God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to us who have gone astray from your ways and bring us again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word, Jesus Christ, your Son. Guide us now by your Holy Spirit through the words of Scripture that we might be led to him who alone is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson today comes from Hosea, the 11th chapter, verses uh, 1 through 9. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more I called Israel, the further they went from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck and bent down to feed them. Will they not return to Egypt, and will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? Swords will flash in their cities and will destroy the bars of the gates and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me. Even if they call to the Most High, he will by no means exalt them. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I turn and devastate Ephraim. For I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. I will not come in wrath. Our next hymn of the morning is hymn number 44.
continue our journey through the Gospel of Luke in this Lenten season. You may remember that as he makes his way to Jerusalem, Jesus continues to encounter people who respond to him, but also opponents. The 15th chapter of Luke has three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the story I will read in just a minute. <clears throat> so I invite you to listen for the Word of God. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eaten, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Here are the opening sentences from Ernest Hemingway's short story, The Capital of the World. Madrid is full of boys named Paco, which is the diminutive of the name Francisco. And there's a Madrid joke about a father who came to Madrid and inserted an advertisement in the personal columns of El Liberal, which said, Paco, meet me at Hotel Montaña, noon Tuesday. All is forgiven, Papa. And how a squadron of Guardia Civil had to be called out to disperse the 800 young men who answered the advertisement. But this Paco, who waited on table at the Pinson Luarca, had no father to forgive him, nor anything for the father to forgive. Here are the opening sentences of Luke's short story, for hundreds of years known as the parable of the prodigal son. 
There was a man who had two sons. The younger one of them said to the father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided the property between them. And a few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. This son, who ended up feeding the pigs in a stranger's field in a distant country, did have a father to forgive him and plenty for the father to forgive. Why do you suppose this parable has been called for centuries the parable of the prodigal son? When Luke clearly begins the story, there was a man who had two sons. To call the story the parable of the prodigal son neglects the other two main characters and makes the younger son the star of the show. But the older brother gets almost as much exposure in the story as his younger brother. Even so, the one character who is constant throughout the story is the father. If word count is any indication of the focus of Luke's story, the fact that the word father occurs 13 times in 22 verses ought to tip us off to the father's importance. In fact, the father plays such an important role in this parable. Many commentaries are now referring to it as the parable of the loving father. While the attention is usually focused on the younger son with a passing glance at the elder brother looking in from the outside, the reality is both sons are defined by their relationships with their father. Both sons offend their father. Both sons shame their father in front of the entire community. Both sons relate to their father by calculating what they need to do to earn their father's love and favor and generosity. The younger son thinks to himself, if I just go home and offer to work in the fields and pay off the debt I owe to my father, at least I'll get enough to eat and maybe I can get back in his good graces. The elder brother thinks, if I work hard, keep my nose clean, obey the law, obey my father, toe the line, I'll get what's rightfully mine because he'll owe it to me. Neither one of the boys counted on their father not playing by the rules they had set up. One of the most meaningful books I have read in the last 10 years is Henry Nouwen's The Return of the Prodigal Son, A Story of Homecoming. In 1983, in a school office in France, Henry Nouwen saw a poster of Rembrandt's painting of The Return of the Prodigal Son. Here's how he described what he saw. I saw a man in a great red cloak, tenderly touching the shoulders of a disheveled boy kneeling before him. I could not take my eyes away. I felt drawn by the intimacy between the two figures, the warm red of the man's cloak, the golden yellow of the boy's tunic, and the mysterious light engulfing them both. But most of all, it was the hands, the old man's hands, as they touched the boy's shoulders that reached me in a place where I had never been reached before. Three years later, Henry Nouwen had the opportunity to sit in front of Rembrandt's original painting, which hangs in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, Russia. And he sat for four hours. And he said there had been moments in which I had wondered whether the real painting might disappoint me. The opposite was true. Its grandeur and splendor made everything recede into the background and held me completely captivated. Coming here was indeed a homecoming. The name of the book is The Return of the Prodigal Son. But Nowen begins his book with a chapter called The Story of Two Sons and Their Father, in which he retells the story from Luke 15. And Nowen freely admits that he had always focused on the two sons, mainly the younger son, 
in his reading, in his study, his understanding, his interpretation of the parable. However, he said, after he saw Rembrandt's painting in his friend's office on that poster and then had the chance to sit in front of the eight-foot-high, six-foot-wide original painting, now and realized that the father is the main character in the story. Part one of the book is about the younger son. Part two is about the elder son. Part three is about the father. And he describes in detail how Rembrandt portrayed the characters in the painting and makes his theological observations about the story. But interestingly enough, the conclusion of a book entitled The Return of the Prodigal Son, which is the name of the painting, the concluding paragraph or the conclusion of the book is called Becoming the Father. No doubt if you're at all familiar with this parable, you found yourself identifying with either the younger son or the elder brother or both at different times in life. But have you ever identified with the loving father? Here's what Nowen says in his conclusion. I'm amazed at how long it has taken me to make the father the center of my attention. It was so easy to identify with the two sons. Their outer and inner waywardness is so understandable and so profoundly human that identification happens almost spontaneously as soon as the connections are pointed out. For a long time, I identified myself so fully with the younger son that it did not even occur to me that I might be more like the elder son. But as soon as a friend said, aren't you the elder son in that story, it was hard to see anything else. Seemingly, we all participate to a greater or lesser degree in all the forms of human brokenness. Neither greed, nor anger, nor lust, nor resentment, neither frivolity, nor jealousy are completely absent from any one of us. Our human brokenness can be acted out in so many ways, but there is no offense, no crime, no war that does not have its seeds in our own hearts. Then he writes, but what of the father? Why pay so much attention to the sons when it is the father who is in the center and when it is the father with whom I am to identify? Why talk about so much about being like the sons when the real question is, are you interested in being like the father? It feels somehow good to be able to say, well, those sons are like me. It gives a sense of being understood. But how does it feel to say the Father is like me? Do I want to be like the Father? Do I want to be not just the one who is being forgiven, but also the one who forgives? Not just the one who is being welcomed home, but the one who welcomes home. Not just the one who receives compassion, but the one who offers it as well. In other words, now and asks us to think about what it means to be and to do what Jesus says in his sermon on the plain earlier in Luke. Jesus said, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Another way to translate that is be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. In telling this parable of the father and his two sons, Jesus isn't making a particular point as much as he is painting a picture of who our God is and what our God is like. And our God is like the prodigal father. And if it surprises you to hear me call God the prodigal father or the prodigal God, maybe it's because you grew up hearing this parable and thinking that prodigal means something like rebellious or troublemaking or something like that, based entirely on the younger son's reputation. But prodigal doesn't mean anything like that. As an adjective, prodigal means recklessly extravagant or yielding abundantly. As a noun, the prodigal is one who spends or gives lavishly and foolishly. So it's fair to call the younger son the prodigal son because after all, he squandered his property. But when you think about what the father did for his younger son, 
bringing out the best robe, putting a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, killing the fatted calf, feeding the whole town at a big party. It's accurate to call him the prodigal father. He spent lavishly only the best for this son who was dead but is alive again, who was lost but is found. From the older brother's perspective, and maybe or probably from the perspective of the townspeople, the father was foolish and he spent recklessly. But the father put it all into perspective when he tells his older son, but we had to celebrate and rejoice because this son of mine, this brother of yours, was dead, but he's alive again. He was lost, but he is found. So let's not forget about the older brother. Maybe you feel a little sorry for him as he stands outside looking in the window, smelling the barbecue, listening to the music. You've never even given me a young goat so that I can celebrate with my friends, he complains to his father. Even though I've done everything I'm supposed to do, I've obeyed you, I've followed the rules, I've worked hard in the fields, and you haven't done anything for me. And just imagine the love in the father's eyes and in his voice that might break when he says to his son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. The father is generous to both sons. The father is a prodigal also because he recklessly and extravagantly and abundantly makes himself vulnerable in loving his two lost sons. He gives them their freedom. They break his heart. But he stands ready to welcome them home just the same. In fact, he doesn't just stand ready to welcome them home. He runs out to meet the younger son while he's still start far off. He leaves the party and the celebration and goes out to where the older brother is. It makes you wonder if the Apostle Paul might not have had this parable in mind when he wrote these words, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for us, but God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. Can't you picture God running out to greet us and throwing his arms around us? When Nancy and I lived in Rocky Mount in the early 1980s, she gave me a very special birthday present one year. It was a print of a photograph of my father taken when he was 22 years old. He's dressed in his Tulane University college sweater. Nancy had the photo mailed to the church, so I wouldn't find it in the mail at home. She told me that when she showed it to the church secretary, Anne said, that's a great picture of Phil. When was it taken? And Nancy said, 1942. <laughs> and Anne laughed and said, well, he's aged very well. <laughs> Not like our church secretary said. <laughs> when I went to Atlanta in October for the funeral of my best friend's father, I stopped by to see my mom at her assisted living place. I walked into her room in my suit and tie, and my mom looked at me and she said, well, hello, Adley, that was my father's name. And she said, you sure look like your dad. Maybe that's what the picture of the prodigal father is meant to show us, that we are called to be like our prodigal God, who extends his grace and mercy and love in surprising and disturbing and freeing and welcoming ways. But when we can't do that, and when we don't do that, it's also good news that whether we are the younger son or the elder brother or a combination of both, we have a prodigal heavenly father who loves us recklessly and extravagantly and abundantly and lavishly and maybe even foolishly. God has put his message out. Child, meet me in Jesus Christ. All is forgiven. Unlike Paco, 
we have plenty for our Heavenly Father to forgive. Praise God that unlike Paco, we have the prodigal father to forgive us. Let us pray. God of the lost, God of the least, God of all who long for home, when we wander from your ways and waste the gifts you have given us, welcome us back, we pray, so that we may celebrate and rejoice in your presence forever and ever. Through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son. Amen. As we pray today, let us lift up Mark Roberts' mother. Mark and Sherry are staying up in Rocky Mount right now, and his mother was visiting them and fell and is in the hospital there. So let us keep her in our prayers. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we praise you and glorify you and thank you for sending us Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Redeemer. We praise you and glorify you and thank you for the gift of baptism and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, deliver us from the bondage of sin that we may serve you in perfect freedom and rejoice in your unfailing, extravagant love. Renew us by your Holy Spirit that we may follow your commands and show your love in all that we do. God of all compassion, in you we live and move and have our being. You made us in your image. You have made us for yourself. You have claimed us in baptism. You have marked us as Christ's own forever. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. We thank you that Jesus Christ spread his arms wide on the cross, welcoming all who turn to you and seek to be your, his disciples. In Jesus Christ, lifted up on the cross, you opened for us the path to eternal life. May we, your children born again of water and of the Spirit, joyfully serve you in newness of life and faithfully walk in your ways through Christ. Loving God, your beloved Son gave us this invitation. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Lord, we open our hearts in prayer this morning as we lift up the burdens we each carry. And as we pray for the burdens that press down upon our families and friends, our neighbors, our community, and the world. We pray for Mark's mother in the hospital in Rocky Mount and ask that your spirit will comfort her and Mark and Sherry. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Turn your ear to us and grant us your peace. Gracious God, in baptism, you claimed us as your own, cleansing us from sin and giving us new life. 
You made us members of your body, the church, calling us to be your servants in the world. Send us forth by the power of your Spirit to love and serve you with joy and to work for justice and peace in all the earth. May we grow in faith, hope, and love and be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's continue our worship as we present our tithes and our offerings. God of grace, love, and mercy, through Christ you have reconciled us to you. You are willing to look beyond our disobedience and disloyalty and have opened your arms wide in welcome when in our repentance we return to you. Lord, may the giving we do this morning be a pledge of our desire to make your redeeming, reconciling love known to others who believe they are not worthy 
or are beyond your reach. May our offering be used to empower that good news. We pray in the name of Christ, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 774. May Christ, our crucified Savior, draw you to himself so that you may find in him the assurance of sins forgiven and the gift of eternal life. Go in peace to follow and serve the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. <laughs>